If you have your Bibles this morning, we're going to be uh, reading from the, uh, from the book of Hebrews. That's the Hebrews. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 13. Bef- before we, we get there, just a few things. We've been preaching these last uh, several weeks about rebuilding the altar. We talked about rebuilding the altar. How many of you who are saved remembered when you came to Christ that, that day that you came to Christ, it might have been in a church, it might have been on a street corner, it might have been in your living room, wherever, wherever it was. When you came to Christ, you built an altar. And remember, we said that altars, when we talk about altars, we're talking about a place where we encounter God, a place where we worship God, a place where we bring a sacrifice, and it's a place of remembrance. If you read through the, through the Bible... All these things, every time one of, one of uh, the patriarchs would come in contact with God, they would build an altar, and they would remember, they would name it. Remember jo- uh, Abraham, when he offered his son Isaac on the mountain, he named it Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees and provides, because God provided a lamb. And we've been talking about going back and rebuilding the altar, and I keep, I keep reminding us of this, that in our lives as believers, uh, since I've been saved, there have been altars I have built that have not been unto God. How many know what I'm talking about? There's places where we've tried to encounter things that weren't godly. There's times in our lives when we've worshipped things that had nothing to do with God or the Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ. we build altars, and sometimes those altars remain, and, and these altars, uh, they become strongholds that we have to pull down. Uh, this morning, I want to read from Hebrews chapter... 13, and uh, we're going to start at verse 8. Now, you know that Hebrews was a letter written, some believe by the Apostle Paul and some say someone else, but it was written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it was written to Jews who had become Christians, because all the first Christians were what? They were, they were Jewish. Uh, the early apostles, the first uh, 30, 40 years of the church, uh, were really primarily, they were, all the Christians were Jews. When the message of the gospel started getting out to the Gentiles in, in mass, and it wasn't long after the crucifixion that Peter was called to speak to Cornelius, a Gentile, uh, a Roman soldier, but yet it wasn't, it wasn't until a few years later that Gentiles started getting saved. You know, the, the gospel started going forth throughout all the Roman Empire. When that happened, a lot of the Jewish Christians who were raised with, they were raised with the Mosaic Law. They were raised with every year the Day of Atonement and every year the Passover and every year the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and the, and the Feast of Weeks and so forth. And, and they were raised with the dietary laws. There were certain things they weren't allowed to eat and certain things. And they had to be circumcised, and they had to go to the synagogue. They were raised with this all their lives. When they got saved, they just figured it was a continuation. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, so it was a continuation of everything they had learned as kids. So when Gentiles started getting saved, a lot of the Jews went to them and said, well, listen, Okay, yeah, you accepted Christ, that's great, but now you've got to be circumcised, now you've got to stop eating bacon, you've got to stop doing the things that, you know, the, the Old Testament said you couldn't do. And it was like the first great controversy in the church about what are we going to do with these Gentiles coming in here, that they're, you know, they're living like they used to live, they're eating the stuff they used to eat, and they say they're saved, and don't they know they have to follow the law of Moses? Well, if you read Acts chapter 15, and we're not going to turn there, but the, the first church council, the Council of Jerusalem, they determined that it was not necessary for the Gentile Christians to become Jews, to be circumcised, to start obeying the Mosaic laws. Thank the Lord. (laughs) Amen. Thank the Lord that we don't, you know. They said that they couldn't save. As a matter of fact, if you read that, I think it was Peter that said, you know, that stuff couldn't save us. Why do we think it's going to save the Gentiles? So salvation by faith and so forth. Well, a lot of the Jewish Christians said, wait a minute. This just isn't right. We were raised with this. So a lot of them started thinking about going back. The ones who had left Judaism and the ones who had, you know, became, become Christians, they, they said, well, we're going to go back because they couldn't accept the fact that somebody could get saved without being circumcised, without being proselytized into, into, into Judaism. So this letter was written to those Jewish Christians to convince them and to tell them that, listen, the stuff in the Old Testament 
that the law that was given and the, the sacrifices and the offerings and the feast days and so forth, all of that was a picture of what was to come, which was Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came, he fulfilled all that stuff. So he, he completed all that stuff in himself. So it's no longer necessary for Jew or Gentile to go to the temple every year and offer a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. It's no longer necessary for us to go and celebrate the Passover and offer a sacrifice of, of a lamb and so forth. They did that for, for centuries before Christ, but after Christ, he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews was written to convince these people, listen, you can't go back. You can't go back to what you used to be or what you, what you used to think was making you acceptable in God's sight. That doesn't do it anymore. One thing they didn't understand, and one thing a lot of people today don't understand is, there's one way of salvation. There was one way of salvation in the Garden of Eden, and there will be one way of salvation until Christ returns. And that way, that way is we are saved by faith. We're saved by faith. We're saved by what we believe, what God has revealed to us. Well, God has given us the completion of his revelation in the person of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more that he can reveal to us than what's in his word. Yeah, throughout the book of Hebrews, the author says, listen, if you want to go back, there's no other sacrifice for sins. There's nothing else we can do to, to, to change, uh, uh, to, to make us acceptable in God's sight. Jesus Christ did it once for all, and that was all. That's all there was. Now, in Hebrews chapter 13, I want you to read with me, starting in verse 8, okay? You know, if, if that's not working, that's okay. We can, uh, we can leave, it, leave it blank. That's all right. Verse 8. Here's what it says. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter what time you live in, no matter what era you live in, you might have lived 2,000 years ago. You might be living, we're li well, hopefully we're living today. <laughs> we're all alive. We might be alive 100 years from now. It doesn't matter. It's, that's, that word is true. No matter what time of history you live in, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the Garden of Eden, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the millennium, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. His word hasn't changed. The way of salvation hasn't changed. His mercy toward us hasn't changed. His loving kindness hasn't changed. The holiness of God has not changed. God has never changed and will never change. He's always the same. And he always will be the same. Somebody asked a question one time. They said, where was God before the creation? And the answer is, there was no where. There was nowhere. It didn't. It had been, you know, the time, space, uh, uh, matter, continuum. You know what they call, you know, time, space, and matter. It wasn't there. I mean, God was. He was God. He was. Where was he? There was nowhere as we understand it. He was just there. He was there. He was everywhere, and he always will be because he's God. He's an eternal God, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now look what it says. Verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. We have heard none of them. Okay, we, uh, if, if he's the same and he established his word, then we need to be anchored on his word. It needs to be the same. It says, be not carried away with, with, with strange, uh, where was we? Uh, verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. He says our hearts need to be established, need to be rooted, need to be grounded in grace. We need to be living in the grace of God. If we're established and rooted in the grace of God and the word of God, we don't have to be afraid of being carried away because God's grace will keep us. There are so many different doctrines and teachings. There are so many different religions and cults that call themselves Christian today. That if, if, you're, if you're not grounded in God's word, you can talk to five different people and just get your mind all confused and messed up. But his word is the ultimate truth decider. It's, it's, it's the truth detector is God's word. You know, a couple weeks ago we had Brother Bob Anderson here. And he was talking about some of the cults and, 
And uh, in the morning session, the Sunday school session, he was dealing with the Jehovah's Witnesses and how they've set dates. You know, uh, they, they said that the end of the world was coming back in 1914 and 1919 and, and uh, so many different times. And, of course, it's never happened because we're still here. And uh, I, we had him here, and I put a thing in a paper, you know, noted cult expert Bob Anderson is going to be coming talking about. And I put the, the topics. Well, uh, it was the day before yesterday. I, I walked in the house, and Rose was on the phone. She says, here, talk to my husband. And she handed me a phone. Okay. I said, hello. And the guy said, the guy said, uh, uh, is this, uh, is this uh, Pastor Butler, Church of God? I said, yeah. He said, did you have something in your church about the Jehovah's Witnesses? I said, yeah. He says, uh, he says, did you call him a cult? I said, well, specifically, we were talking about their false prophecies. He says, well, where'd you get, where'd you get that information? And if, for those of you who were here, Bob Anderson, he had copies of their own publications where they, they you know, uh, tried to predict the end of the world. I mean, it was in their own writing. I said from the uh, Watchtower Society and, the, and, and Awake, you know, Awake Magazine and so forth. And he said, well, you know, he says, they got lawyers. I said, well, I says, we got lawyers too. <laughs> and he said, he says, they're a big, he says, they're a big organization. I said, well, we're a big organization too. <laughs> so, so I said, I said, you know what? I said, you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for, the, for, your, for forgiveness of your sins. He says, the only thing I trust in is money. I said, okay. <laughs> so, so he hung up. All right. But listen, they're out there. These calls, they're out there. And, and when you start to tell the truth, you know, they don't like it. They don't like it. You know what I did? I'll tell you what I did. I got his number was on the caller ID. It didn't have his name, okay? So I did the reverse phone check. Thank God for the Internet. Huh? You can do all kinds of things on here. I did the reverse phone check, and, I, and it was, like, unlisted. So what I did was I found a place where you could send anonymous text messages. <laughs> on it. I had the number. Okay. <laughs> and I sent him a couple. Just scripture. I just sent him scripture. That's all I did. All right. Anyway. Diverse, there's all kinds of crazy teachers. They come knocking on your door. And they want, and they want, to, and they want, to, they want to convince you that they have the truth. Do you know most converts to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are people that were raised in either Catholic or mainline Protestant churches? Most converts. They weren't people off the street, not people that were looking for... They're people that were raised in religion. You see, just like it was spoke this morning, religion can never save you. And what, what these people that this letter was written to, they wanted to go back to the religion of their fathers. Now listen to what he says. He says in verse 10, he says, we have an altar. How many people know you have an altar? You have an altar this morning. You have a place where you can encounter God this morning. You have a place where you can worship God. You have a place where you can bring a sacrifice. You have a place of remembrance. And I'm not necessarily talking about this building or this room or this, this front pew that sometimes people kneel at and pray. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about the cross. We have an altar. We have a place that we can go. When things aren't going right, when it seems like everything's just not working, when, the things, when it seems like the whole world is coming against us, we have a place we can go. The altar that they had before this in Judaism, it was covered with a veil. The only person that could go in there once a year was the high priest, and he had to have blood. They had an altar of incense inside that tent that, that they would offer up the incense uh, that the, only the Levites and the priests could go in there. But you and I, we could never walk in there. But I thank God now as believers in Jesus Christ, I'm not Jewish. I've, I've not been raised in that. It doesn't matter. I have an altar. I have a place where I can go. I can go to my God. Listen, listen to what he says. We have an altar. Whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. I'm going to tell you something. Religion does not give you the right to go into the altar. Religion does not make you acceptable enough in God's eyes that you could go and worship him at the altar. Religion won't do it. Religious practice, religious ritual won't do it. Communion, baptism, it won't do it. The only thing that makes us acceptable is the blood. Of Jesus Christ. The only thing that makes us able to go boldly to the throne of grace is the shed blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. That's the gospel message. 
in any nation, in any tongue, in any language, in any church. It doesn't matter. The only way, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years from now. It's the same. It's the blood and faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. See, that's where our altar has to be. And anything that gets in our way, any stronghold that gets in our way, we need to pull it down. Any, any thought, any imagination that gets in our way, we need to take it captive. I've been saying that a lot. Because, and, and you know what I'm finding out? The more I say that, the more I get thoughts I've got to take captive. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but the more I keep thinking about I've got to take thoughts captive, the more things keep coming up I've got to take captive in the name of Jesus. The more I talk about strongholds, the more I recognize in my life. Listen, I, I want you to look at a couple passages with me. Turn with me to, to Hebrews. It's, it's all in the book of Hebrews. I want to show you a few, a few things. Hebrews chapter chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I want, I want to show you this. This is, this, is, this is what we have that no one else has. You see, all religions have altars. You know, have you ever seen, some of you uh, have seen pictures, and, and, and I've known folks who've been overseas, where if you go to a place like, uh, like India, they got like a couple million gods over there, okay? Uh, you know, and they have altars to these gods. Uh, last week, we read about the Apostle Paul when he was in the city of Athens. He said on every street corner, there was a place where there was an altar. There was a place, an altar to the unknown god, just in case they missed one. Remember last week, I said I drove in these couple streets, you know, uh, Victoria, Lishman, and Kenneth Avenue, up and down. Seventeen churches on these, on these three, just these three streets. I didn't go up on the hill. I didn't go down below the tracks. I, and you would think with that many churches, man, we ought to have like a pristine community here. But it seems like this area is almost one of the worst places there is. Religion doesn't solve anything. But listen to what he says in chapter 4 of Hebrews, starting at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. See, in the Old Testament, in the old religion of the Jews, they had a high priest. Only the high priest could go into the Ark of the Covenant. He could go through the veil and go there and offer blood once a year. But now, as believers, Jew and Gentile alike, we have a great high priest. He's not a human being that had to die for his own sins, or shed blood for his own sins, but we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, that passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, he says, let us hold fast our profession, verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. See, we have a God, when we go to our altar, we go to worship a God that knows what it feels like to be us. He become one of us. He had, he had flesh and blood and bone just like us. He knows what pain feels like. He knows what abandonment feels like. He knows what when you, our, our best friends deny us and uh, uh, run away from us. He understands that. He knows what betrayal is all about. He says, we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore, because of this, come boldly, Unto the throne of grace, we can go boldly or confidently with liberty. We can go to the throne of grace. We can go to the altar and worship him. We can go and encounter him. We can go and make sacrifices to him. We can have a remembrance of when we've talked with him and, and dealt with him, a testimony. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We have an altar that we can go to. He says that let us go boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When I have a time of need and I have help, I know the one I need to go to is Jesus Christ. He's seated at the right hand of the Father praying for me, making intercession for me even right now. He's seated up there praying and making intercession for you right now with the things you're struggling with, with the things that's tearing you up, with the strongholds that you're trying to deal with or the, or the thoughts that you're trying to take captive. He's praying for you to have strength and wisdom and discernment that you'll be able to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's working for you right now. We have an altar that we can go to right now where, he can, where we can speak, that we can encounter God face to face. We can go boldly with liberty, with confidence to obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Turn to chapter 10 in the book of Hebrews. Just a few more verses. And look, start with verse... Uh, but we just got to back up. Um, it says, look at verse uh, 12. Now, 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 the author here is comparing Jesus 
our high priest with the high priest of the Old Testament. Okay, and we're jumping in the middle here. We could read the whole chapter, but I don't want to be here till one o'clock. So it says it twelve in verse twelve. But this man, meaning meaning Jesus, but Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, Jesus Christ, when he shed his blood. He took his blood and he offered it. Just like the high priest in the Old Testament would take blood into the holiest place and take blood and sprinkle it on the ark, on the mercy seat. Jesus, see, that was just a picture of what was really going to happen. Jesus took his own blood. He took his own blood and he brought it to the real mercy seat where the Father sits. Not the picture of one, not the ark, a piece of wood covered with gold. But he took it to the real heavenlies and he offered his blood. And because he did, He sat down, listen, on the right hand of God. That's the place of power. He's at the right hand of God. And it says, from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14. For by one offering he has what? Perfected forever them that are sanctified. Listen, we've been made perfect in the eyes of God. One might not act like it, but by the blood of Jesus, we've been made perfect. We've been made whole. We've been made complete in the eyes of God. When he sees us covered with the blood of Jesus, he sees a perfect human, just like his own son, Jesus Christ. Now, see, it's the Holy Spirit's job to get behind that blood and make us act like it. That's what that sanctification thing is all about. You know, that's what that, he's working on us. And he's trying to make us act like we're sanctified. And he's trying to make us act like God wants us to act. Sometimes he's got a time doing it, too. But God sees you. Do you understand? Can you grab a hold of that? That if you're born again, God sees you this minute. I don't care what you did last night or what you was even thinking this morning. If you're covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, the Father sees you. His son is seated at his right hand and says, I've shed my blood for him. I've washed him in my blood. He sees you as perfect. He sees your sins remitted. Listen. For by one offering, in verse 14, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with him. Brother Jairus preached a good message about covenant yesterday. This is the covenant that I will make with him. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Listen, if you're born again, you got the law of God written right in here. You know, I, we got Ten Commandments. Somebody gave me a Ten Commandments sign to put in front of my house. I put in front of my house. That's all right. If somebody says, you keep the Ten Commandments, I say, I can't keep a one of them. <laughs> I, I can't. Man, I, I get the number one. If I do it in my own strength, number one, I'm, do- I'm done. But by the power of God, I got the commandments written right here. I don't need a sign. I put them up so other people would see, but I don't need because it's right, written, written right here. That whole Torah, that whole law about who God is and how holy he is, it's right here. And if you're born again, it's inside of you too. He says, I'll put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Thank God. He puts them in our minds. Because when I find myself straying, my mind acts up and says, you better stop that. That's called a conscience. And their sins and iniquities, you can shout, their sins and iniquities, I will remember. No. He don't remember them no more. He set them aside. He He won't bring them up to you anymore. You know how that is. You know how we like to bring things up to people? Women are good at that. <laughs> I had to get that in. But he won't bring that thing up. We were talking the other day. Women remember everything that happened. <laughs> all right. Man, I forget what happened last week. My wife remembers something that happened 25 years ago, but that's all right. <laughs> okay. But God don't remember any of that. If he wanted to, he could. He could remember what happened 10 billion years ago. He's God. But he's chosen instead by the blood of Jesus Christ. He takes our sins and he says, that's it. I'm not going to bring them up. I don't have them written in the back of my mind, just ready to pull them out the next time you do something wrong. No, they're done. Man, you can, listen, you, you can shout about that because i got a whole bunch of them that he's set aside. He's not going to remind me about them. Thank the Lord. Now look at verse 19, look. Having therefore, brethren, boldness, liberty, freedom, confidence. That's what that word means. It doesn't mean bragging it doesn't mean you know arrogant it means we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ we can go through the veil in fact when Jesus was crucified that veil was torn in half you read over in Matthew's gospel from the top to the bottom that veil was like six inches thick man God got a hold of that thing just ripped it right in half he said come on in come in come to the altar we have an altar 
that we can go to freely. We don't have to kill a goat or a lamb and get blood and sprinkle it on everything. It's, 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 it's already been done. We have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You know what I'm finding out? That most people, the stumbling block that most people have, they don't think God can forgive them. Oh, God could never forgive me. Oh, I remember, you know, they, they're so fraught with guilt. And Satan loves to pour guilt on you. Satan will remind, Satan doesn't forget anything. He'll remind you about everything you've ever done. And you say, oh, oh, I could never, oh, I've been, I'm, I've been, oh, God could never forgive that. Oh, I, I remember when I, oh. Now, you know what? We need to take that mess and throw it away. We need to put in our minds and our spirits. Yeah, maybe some of the stuff we do is pretty horrible. It's been pretty bad. Some worse than others. But see, there's nothing that the blood of Jesus Christ can't forgive. There's nothing that Jesus can't release you from through faith in his blood. That's why by faith, that's why we're saved by faith. We need to believe that God wants to heal us. He wants to cure us. He wants to make us whole. He wants to make us holy. He wants to take that junk out of our lives. He wants to deliver us from the things that have bound us for so long. He wants to heal us. All he's waiting for us to do is to walk into the holiest place. We can do it. Oh, I can't be. I'm, I can't. Be. No, come. He says, come as you are, washed in the blood of Jesus. That's the only requirement. That we got the blood of Jesus on us. That's the only requirement. He says, and we're going to be closing. He says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance, assurance of faith, in verse 22. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Listen, you need to grab onto the cross and you need to hold on to it and never let go of it. You need to grab onto the gospel and never let go of it. You need to proclaim it every day. You need to pray every day. You need to seek the Lord every day. I mean, you need to, I mean, this is something, this isn't like a once a week thing. If you make it a once-a-week thing, it becomes religion, and it's not worth a hill of beans. But if it's every day, when people are looking when they ain't looking, when people are, you know, you've got your old pious self on, you know how we are sometimes in church. You know, when folks go to church long enough, they know how to act, what to say. You know, they wear the, the tags. You know. But then, then we go home, we take that off. See, it's got to be every day. 20, our relationship, our altar is not, just, is not just, you know, once a week or twice a week. Our altar is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He says, let us hold fast our profession of our faith without wavering. Brothers and sisters, we need to anchor our feet on the solid rock. It will never shake. Satan will try to come and put doubt and put fear in your mind. Brother sang that song. We're free from doubt. We're moving on from doubt. We're moving on from fear. He says, and let us consider one another to provoke one another. Oh, we like to provoke one another, don't we? <laughs> but to provoke un one another what? Unto what? Love. Good works. Thanks. Love and good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. He's saying, listen, we have an altar that we can go to. It's open for all who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't have to dress a certain way. You don't have to go to some country somewhere. You don't have to go to another nation. You don't have to go to some shrine somewhere. You don't have to go to some altar. Now, the altar is right here. The law is right here. The altar, I, Moses said, it's as far, it's in your mouth and in your heart. That's where we are. And we can go anytime. And it doesn't cost any money. Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. Now look at this. <laughs> see, see, some folks will look at this and they'll say, oh, God can't. Now listen, read this. 
I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to go this far, but I might as well, since we're here. For if we sin willfully, uh-oh, I, I, I don't know. I think most sin is kind of willful myself, but that's all right. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. See, but, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, some folks read this, and they say, oh, my God. Oh. You know, because, see, I, I'm going to tell you the truth about the pastor here. There have been a few times I have sinned willfully since I've been saved. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I'm, I might not be talking about anything that's going to make the newspaper, okay, but let's face it. And some folks will think, oh, I got saved and I sinned and oh, God. That's not what he's talking about. Here's what he's saying. If Jesus isn't enough, there ain't enough. If the blood of Jesus isn't enough, there isn't enough. If you can't go to him for the forgiveness of your sins, there's not an angel or demon. There's not a place in this universe where you can find forgiveness if it's not for Jesus. Oh, no, no, no. You know, see, it's, it's not, oh, I, I did this and he could never forgive me. No, he wants to forgive you. He wants to come. It says in God's word, it says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we got to go to him. If I go back, he's writing these people, Said, if you go back to, to Judaism, it's not enough. If Jesus' blood isn't enough, there isn't enough. But I want to tell you something, his blood is enough. And we have an altar that we can go to this morning. Wherever you've been, where, whatever you've done, however you've lived your life, wherever you've been. I'm talking to believers now. Maybe there's somebody here that's not a believer this morning and you want to become one. We'll give you that opportunity. But I'm talking to believers this morning where you've, you've been saved and you find yourself, just your life is so cluttered and you remember, you just vaguely remember that altar that you started your life at. I want to tell you something. The door is open to the altar. And all it takes is the blood of Jesus. You don't got to take classes. You don't got to go for counseling. You don't got to go to some psychiatrist or psychologist. All you need is to come to the cross. Because that's the blood of Christ. That's the altar. That's the place where we get our new life. That's the place that our brother saying, lead me to the cross. That's where my sins are forgiven. And we have an altar. We need to rebuild the altar. We need to go back to the altar. We need to get back to what this word says about who Jesus is and what he came to do. Because that's the only hope that we have. That's our only salvation, is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. How many people know? I'm, I'm, I just want to, you don't have to put your hand up, but I, I want you to think about this. How many people have ever thought, oh, I'm, God's done with me? I've, I've, God's done with me. I, he must have, oh, God will never. Now listen, you might be able to say that about people. Because there's some people that are there. There's some folks that say, I'll never forgive them. Okay. Maybe somebody in here has said that in their heart about somebody in their life. I'll never forgive them. Maybe something horrible with somebody done to you. I'll never forgive them. Well, listen. Before you deal with that, I just want you to listen to this. Jesus never said, I'll never forgive them. His hand is outreached this morning. It's outreached. The altar is open. He says, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. What, you don't know what I've done. I, I don't care what you've done. He knows what you've done. He's saying, come to me. Come to me. All you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. His, his invitation is to come. For those of you, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you might feel pretty bad about yourself because of something you've done. Or some, something, you know, you may have a lot of guilt. I'm here to tell you this morning, according to God's word, if you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Father sees you as sinless. Now, he wants his Holy Spirit to do the work in your life to take that sin out of you in a very practical sense. I'm just going to ask George to come in and play a little bit, something softly. And, and uh, you know, if you, if you just need to pray, well, I'm going to ask you all to stand. And, and we're, we're just going to, like, just, just stand with me and... 
and where you're at. You know, I'm, we're not necessarily going to do the altar call this morning, but, you know, where you're at. And, of course, if you want to come, you can come. If you want to come here for prayer, you can come. If you want to stay where you're at and pray, that's okay too. God knows. But if you want to come, we'll pray with you. But see, this is about going to the altar. We believe God for healing. We, I, mean, I pray for healing. And, and, and there are many people in this, in this church that, that need healing in their bodies. And we pray all the time. We have prayer all, uh, every week for healing. And we believe God is able to heal, and that's important. But so much more important this morning is where are you at at the altar? Have you been, have you been to the throne of grace lately? Have you gone there? I want to invite you to go to the throne of grace this morning with me. We have boldly, we can boldly go to the throne of grace and seek help in the time of need. How many people are in a time of need right now? You're in a time of need. It might be, it might be financial, it might be physical, but, but spiritual. How many people have a spiritual need this morning? A spiritual need. You know, the, the financial stuff, that'll take care of itself. The physical stuff, we pray and go to doctors and that'll take care of itself. But the spiritual stuff, oh, that's, that's where we got to go to the mercy seat. God, give us mercy. God, give us mercy through the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus oh the blood of Jesus oh the blood of Jesus it washes white as snow. Let's sing it one more time. Thank God for the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes white as snow. Listen, you can, where you're standing, if you want prayer, if you want to come up and stand, that's all right. We got some room up here. If you, if you want prayer for anything, won't you come? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are able to deliver us from everything. Father, we're thankful that you've told us in your word that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come with confidence, with freedom. We can come with an expectation that you're going to hear and move in the name of Jesus. We believe that you are able to take our lives and make them what you want them to be. We can't do it, but I know you can do it. And Father, we believe that you are able. For those who put their hands up with the, for spiritual, we have a spiritual need. You are able to fix that spiritual need this morning. Nobody else can, but you're able. Father, we believe that you're able this morning. Father, reach down and touch each and every hand that was raised here this morning. Each and every one, there's lots of them, Lord. I pray, God, that you would reach down and to, to be there, help in a time of need. And God, that we would become, Father, as we grow, as we, as we eat the, the meat of the word, and as we get ourselves established on the word of God and, and get, our, get our faith lined up with what your word says, to believe that our sins are forgiven by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing or nobody that can take us out of your hand. Father, I pray, Lord, that, that you would encourage us, that every one of us in here would have a newfound faith. Some of us, maybe some of our faith has dried up. Maybe some of us have, have veered to the left or to the right. But God, I pray that we be a renewal of faith this morning. That there would be a resurrection of faith this morning. Man, the Apostle Paul, when he was preaching in the, in, on Mars Hill and he was telling them about Jesus and he talked about ra being raised from the dead, some of them laughed and some of them believed. I want to tell you something. We need a resurrection this morning. People talk about a revival. I don't need a revival. I need a resurrection this morning. I need some things to come back to life that once we're dead. I need some things to come to life. That once we're dead. How about you? 
Huh? How about, how about, can you remember in your life when you first got saved, there were some things that were living and lively, and now after so many years, man, you find out that they, they the, the coals have kind of gotten cold. We need to start fanning the flame a little bit. You know how, they, how you do that on a campfire when it starts getting cold and you start fanning that flame, it starts heating up? Man, we need to start fanning some flames this morning. We need to have some things come back to life this morning. God, send a resurrection. Oh, the blood. Rose, we come. Of Jesus. Pray for the Lord. Jesus.